What's up everybody? So in this video, we're going to be talking about viruses. Um, this actually is a topic that did not even exist in the previous syllabus at all. So this is completely new and I honestly think it's pretty much just because of COVID. Just because COVID-19 happened, which is a virus, right? We know COVID-19 is a virus. I guess now they just want you guys to know about it, right? Because maybe there'll be another virus attack at some point soon. So um, I guess this is something new for you guys. So viruses, there's a, a few things that we got to cover here, but it, I don't think it's too challenging. The extent to which, I got, to which you guys need to know it is not too bad. So let's just get into it. So a virus, virus. So first of all, where is it? Can you see a virus? No way. You cannot see a virus. A virus is teeny, teeny, tiny, um, even tinier than bacteria, even tinier than, than bacteria and bacteria are tiny. So basically viruses are super, super small. And I want to give you some examples. Um, you know, rabies, right? Rabies is um, that um, a virus that actually um, can, can infect dogs, right? And it can be transmitted from dogs to humans, right? This virus will infect these dogs, causing them to go crazy, essentially, and um, um, kind of behave abnormal for a normal dog, right? Normal dogs are not so crazy or not so violent, but it makes them go violent. And you can see it a lot in their saliva. You can see they have a lot of saliva hanging. It's kind of unusual. And when they bite a human, it will get transmitted to the human. And it pretty much guarantees death to a human if you're not vaccinated. It's one of the most um, dangerous, highest death rate um, viruses ever. So um, that's one example of a virus. And we got other, other ones like Spanish flu, HIV, COVID-19, surprise, surprise, and influenza, right? So there's many kinds of viruses and there's way, way many more, many, many, many kinds. So we know that they matter because they clearly do. We just had covid we know rabies is dangerous. We know HIV. These are all things we've probably heard about. So it's definitely important to know about. So let's get let's continue. So a good way for me to explain about a virus really is is to relate back to the idea of the prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. We know we can divide all living things on Earth into two kinds of cells, right? Um, let me show you here. We can do it as prokaryotic. Prokaryotic cells is one category. Um, and eukaryotic is the other category. So this makes, um, how this works is, right, all organisms on Earth has a common ancestor where all living things originated from. So over time, these three big domains form, eukarya, archaea, and bacteria. And they're all made up of cells, right? All living things are made up of cells. But there's a difference. Two categories were made based on the how the cells look. This category had cells that were different from this category. So they called them eukaryotic cells. There were some structural differences. They looked a bit different than these here, which were called prokaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells, right, are, are things like um, that all plants are made of, all animals are made of, um, all these kind of things, the things that we typically think of uh, as living things. And then prokaryotic cells will be things like bacteria, very small things that can infect you. They can also be useful for you, all these kind of things. So if this is eukaryotes, and eukaryotes includes the things I just mentioned, and this is prokaryotes, so where's viruses? So viruses does not fall into any of these categories because a virus is non-living. It is not considered a living thing, and you'll see later on in the video why. Um, so that's what I want you to understand. Virus is non-living. That's where we got to start. A virus does not fall into any kind. It's not a cell. A cell is a thing that can carry out the functions of life, right? So a virus is not a cell, it is not a living thing, it is not in any of these categories, it is its own independent uh, identity, okay, a virus. It's not living. That's important to know. Okay, so now, um, you need to, there's a few words we need to know, and you may know about them now because of the whole COVID thing that happened, so let's start with some key words. Um, outbreak. What does outbreak mean? Outbreak. So if you, let's take a country, this is Africa right here, this is uh, the continent Africa, and then here we have a small island, right, Madagascar. Um, let's say there's a new virus that went there and infected a small group of people. We call this an outbreak. Okay, we call this an outbreak. And officially, how we can describe it is like this. It's an unexpected increase in the number of people with a specific condition. So COVID obviously started as an outbreak in Wuhan, China, right? So that's outbreak. When the outbreak spreads, um, spreads ac across a larger geographical area, meaning it starts covering more land, we call it an epidemic. Um, so here. Now, when this epidemic 
So this small circle here represents the outbreak. When it spreads over a larger geographical area, we call it an epidemic. And when this spreads over the entire world, like COVID then did, we call it a pandemic. So you call an epidemic a pandemic when it goes worldwide. So overall, we can look at it, these three words as they have this relationship. You start with um, when, a, when a virus starts infecting a group of people, we, it starts as an outbreak. Then it will spread, become an epidemic, and then a pandemic. So this is very important. Understand the relationship between these three words. And obviously, this concept doesn't apply only to viruses. It can be to any kind of infectious disease. It can be bacteria, um, parasites, anything like that. So just know it's not only um, suitable for viruses. So now there's a field in science which studies pandemics, epidemics, like the focus of the field. You know how scientists can do research. There's one kind of job called epidemiology okay and you need to know the definition of this and it's basically the study of the occurrence distribution and control of disease in a population so essentially studying how diseases move how they work how the, which diseases are more prevalent in certain populations that's just what epidemiology is you just need to know this vague definition and what it is okay okay so we know now a virus is non-living and we know now these three key words of how a virus can spread and be classified as a, under a different category. So let's look at some characteristics of a virus. How does a virus look like? What can it look like? Its size and that kind of thing. So there's a few, few details you need to know. Here's our virus, okay, our virus. Um, it is thought to be one of the most abundant biological entities. What this means is it is very, there's a large amount of them way more than there's way more viruses way way more viruses than there are humans they're very abundant and see they don't call them a cell because they're not a cell they're just an entity they're not a cell they're not a living thing okay so the key the first key thing which i already mentioned is that viruses are teeny tiny they are very very small you need a very strong microscope to see them like an electron microscope they're tiny teeny tiny okay so they have a small fixed size what i mean by fixed Remember, a cell, a living thing, can grow, um, can grow. It can increase in size and then divide and so on. Um, a virus is fixed. It does not grow. Whatever size it is, it stays that way. It does not reach puberty. It will not grow up. It's a fixed size because it's non-living. That's the first kind of characteristic. So I'm going to cover here a few characteristics we need to know about viruses. Um, the next one, well, actually, first, while we're at that, remember how I said viruses are non-living just now. So why are they not considered alive? Okay, so in one of the previous videos, we talked about um, how cells are the smallest unit of life. That's one of the cell theories, right? One of the three cell theories we need to know. Cells are the smallest unit of life. And they are considered the smallest unit of life because they carry out the seven functions of life. A virus is not considered the smallest unit of life. It is not considered living because it does not carry out the functions of life. It doesn't grow. It doesn't do homeostasis. It doesn't um, do nutrition. It doesn't do growth. It doesn't do anything like that. None of the functions of life, which I talked about in the, pre in the previous video. So you'll see later, the only way a virus can exist and duplicate is by using your own cells, your body cells. Without you, they cannot um, survive. They cannot continue to replicate. They need you. They need you to survive. So by themselves, they cannot live. They need you. And we'll see exactly why this is later. So they are not considered living, okay? Because of the fact that they cannot carry out the functions of life. They cannot survive by themselves. Okay, so what's the next characteristics? So remember, just like any, um, just like the prokaryotes and eukaryotes that contain DNA, viruses also contain DNA. So they also contain nucleic acid, right? Nucleic acid, there are two, two kind of, um, DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids, right? So they contain nucleic acid, and it can be DNA, it can be RNA, um, it can be double-stranded, it can be single-stranded, okay? It can be any of these. So it's not set. It doesn't have to be DNA. It doesn't have to be RNA. It depends on the, set, on the, depends on the virus. Some viruses have DNA. Some have RNA. Some have double-stranded DNA. Some have double-stranded um, single-stranded RNA or single-stranded DNA. Um, it varies, right? It's not set to, to one... Um, it depends on the virus. Okay, simple. So they're small and they have DNA in there somewhere. Okay, next. They can be enclosed by a capsid. 
So a capsid is a membrane, a sort of membrane, and we'll see later a clear, more clear structure, but it's basically a membrane. So it can be this membrane enclosing the virus, like a, it's like a plasma membrane, in, essentially, okay? But we call it in a virus, we call it capsid. And its purpose is to um, help determine the ability to infect. It is the wall of the cell, and it can uh, get into contact with your body cells, right? So a virus can go infect different people, different creatures. Um, and that depends on this, 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 this wall. Sometimes this, this wall will like your lungs. Sometimes this wall will like your heart. So this wall determines the ability to infect. Sometimes it is good at infecting. Sometimes it is bad. It has little structures on it that helps it infect you. So that's what the capsid will do. Bear in mind also... Um, viruses, we have, there's so many viruses on earth, right? And not all viruses infect us. Sometimes there's viruses that can infect your dog, but not you. And sometimes there's a virus that can infect your you, but not your dog. So viruses aren't always bad for you. Some viruses um, affect and infect you. Some other ones don't give a crap about you. Okay, also know that. Okay, they do not have a cytoplasm. So remember, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, the cells, cells have a cytoplasm. But remember, this is not a cell. It has no cytoplasm. It has no, no, nothing like that. Okay. Now, so sometimes, so they always have a capsid and they always have nucleic acid and they have no cytoplasm. Sometimes they can have another layer outside of the capsid and we call it an envelope. And it is useful for recognition. So like recognizing the cell it's about to attack and it's good at attaching to that cell. So normally... Not all cells have this, only some, and not all viruses have this, I mean, only some, and they're normally located outside of the capsid. So the capsid is a layer, the envelope would be outside that layer, if it exists, it doesn't always exist. Okay, and remember, viruses are obligatory intracellular parasites. What does this mean? This means they are parasites. Parasites means it uses your cells to survive. It has no benefit to your cells. A parasite is an organism that benefits off of you um, but you do not benefit off of it. You, in fact, suffer from it. So that's a parasite. So a virus is an obligatory. Obligatory means mandatory. It needs to be. There's no other option. And intracellular means inside, inside a cell. So it's a, it's a parasite that goes into your cell and they must be there. Otherwise, they cannot survive. They cannot survive without, without your cells. They are non-living. They need your cells to survive. So it's an obligatory intracellular parasite. So these are, um, that's how many, six, six key characteristics you need to know about viruses in general. And remember, they are not alive. Okay, they're not alive. They do not carry out the functions of life. They are not a cell. Okay, now, remember I said, um, viruses, if you get infected with, let's say, COVID-19 or some virus, normally this virus has a specific target because of the capsid. Okay, because of this capsid layer, right? This capsid is the thing that helps determine its ability to infect. So sometimes the capsid, so for example, in COVID-19, the capsid loves your lung cells, right? That's why, you're, that's why you get pneumonia or your, your lungs get infected with COVID. Whereas other viruses have other targets. So for example, polio is also a virus and it loves to infect your nervous system, okay? It doesn't give a crap about the rest of your body, but it loves your nervous system. So hepatitis virus, loves to infect your liver cells, your liver cells. Human HIV loves to infect your white blood cells, specifically your T cells. So what I'm trying to say is that viruses, um, when, when a virus is present, it normally has a specific target. It doesn't infect your entire body. It normally targets one, one thing, one thing that, it's, that, that it likes, okay? So that's also important to know. They are specific. They specifically attack um, a specific area. Okay, it depends on the virus. Okay, now in general, viruses can have all can be all types and sh uh, shapes and sizes. Um, they're always very small, but they can still vary in shape and size. Uh, they can have any of these shapes. They can be polyhedral, which is just many sides like this polyhedral. They can be spherical. They can be helical, like a cylinder. Uh, they can be complex, like this thing here. So there's no set shape to a virus. They can be different shapes. Bear that in mind as well. Okay, now before I go on to this, I just want to recap what we just talked about to make sure we're clear. We're on the same page because now we're going to get into a little process. Remember, viruses 
there are many viruses. Virus can cause different diseases. Virus can infect different organisms. Um, we need to know that viruses are non-living. They are not cells. They're not prokaryotic or eukaryotic. Eukaryotic. They are its own category. They're not living. Okay. Um, you need to understand these three key words and their relationship with each other. And we need to understand some key um, um, structural characteristics of a virus. Okay. And you can see how this is very different from a normal cell. So they're clearly different. Remember, they're not alive. I want to emphasize that a lot. This comes up a lot of times as a simple question. And then a lot of people forget they're not, they're not living. And then they get the question wrong. So very important. Remember, they're not alive. They're not living. And they need to remember that they're non-specific. They don't attack your entire body, every organ, every cell. They love some cells. And that's due to their what? Their capsid. The capsid decides what they want, what they're going to infect. <clears throat> and remember, different sizes. Okay. Now, how? So I told you, remember... I just told you before, remember this, um, a, a cell can do mitosis, it can divide, become more, right, it can divide by itself, it reads the DNA, it would divide by mitosis, if it's a eukaryotic cell, if it's a prokaryotic cell, it's going to divide by a process called binary fission, right, it can divide by itself, it just uses its, its organelles or its resources and it can divide, it can become more and more, it can grow, but viruses cannot, they are non-living, meaning they cannot do reproduction. They cannot carry out the function of life, one of which is reproduction. So how do they get more? When you get infected by a virus, why all of a sudden is there? are you infected by one and the next moment you have 10,000 viruses in you? The reason why is because they can reproduce, but not by themselves. They need your cells, and I'm going to show you how. We're going to talk now about two cycles, the lytic cycle and the lysogenic cycle. These two are cycles, these two are ways which viruses reproduce, but how they replicate, okay? I'm gonna show you, and it's straightforward, it's very interesting. So we're gonna use the bacteriophage as an example. This is one kind of virus. Remember when we looked at this? This is one uh, shape a virus can be. We're gonna look at this one, bacteriophage. So just, for, just as an example, but most viruses work the same. So if you understand this one, you understand the rest of the viruses pretty much. So we got this bacteriophage, right? Notice it's got um, this capsid. Remember, this is the, the layer. It's got a bunch of other stuff going on as well, but the key structure here, the capsid, and it's got DNA, right? Sometimes viruses have RNA, but we're going to use this one, and it's going to say it, we're going to say it has DNA. And then this right here is something called a host cell. So bacteriophages, you need to understand, they infect bacteria, right? Bacteria is a living thing. So the concept applies. You can just pretend this is your, your body cell. It also works the same way. You can also pretend this is a eukaryotic cell. Just know this is a living cell and this is a virus, non-living. And we're going to see how it uses this living cell, whether or not that's your body cells or a bacteria cell. It doesn't matter. The concept applies. So we call this cell that gets infected a host cell because it's like the host of a house. It's going to have, it's going to have your, your friends come over and you're hosting them. You're allowing them to be there. You're taking care of them. Same thing here. This cell is technically a host cell because it's inviting, it's not inviting it, but it's taking care of it. Okay. <clears throat> so here we have this living cell. It's got its DNA here, the chromosome. It's got a cell wall and a plasma membrane, all that stuff, right? From prokaryotic cells. <clears throat> now, the first step in the lytic cycle, and you'll see why it's called the lytic cycle later, is it attaches. It's called attachment. This virus, or in this case, the bacteriophage, will attach to this living cell, whatever this living cell is, wherever it is. Um, then we go to the second step. Called penetration. Okay, penetration. What it does is it uses this little sharp bit at the end. We're going to look at this later in the video. And it penetrates the wall. And once it's penetrated, it can now send its DNA inside of this host cell. And see, that's what it does. It sends it in. So we got attachment, and then we got penetration and release of the DNA. Then we go to step three. Okay, we're just going to give a name. It's called biosynthesis. What that means is, remember, what is your DNA? What is your DNA? Your DNA is your instruction manual. When a living cell reads DNA, it's going to do what it says, right? That's just how it works. It's instructions. So now that this, these instructions are injected into this living cell, this living cell isn't going to know if this DNA is its own DNA or another thing's DNA. 
It doesn't matter. It's just going to take it and do what it says. So now that the DNA is inside this living cell, it's going to start doing what it says. It's going to do biosynthesis. Biosynthesis means sim synthesizing of things, right? Synthesizing, synthesizing things. Um, so it starts reading it. And remember, I'm not, this, this image is fairly straightforward here. But remember, there's ribosomes. There's all these things going on here um, that help to synthesize the DNA. It's just not shown here. So the cell is going to take this DNA, its ribosomes are going to read it and synthesize exactly what this DNA is saying. And guess what this DNA is saying? This DNA is the DNA of this virus. So it's going to make another virus, right? It, this is the instructions of how to be a virus. So it does this biosynthesis, synthesizing the whole virus again, and not just once, many times, right? Because it's going to read it once, make do what it says, read it again, do what it says. It's going to do it many, many times. It's going to do it so many times until something happens. And I'll show you now. So this is kind of redundant, the next step, just maturation. That just means putting all the pieces together. So we, you're synthesizing all the pieces, and then it gets put together in the maturation stage. Um, these are kind of linked. And then the last one, so it synthesizes so many of these, these viruses that eventually the cell gets destroyed. Okay, It gets so full of them that it splits in a process called lysis. That's what we call it, the lytic cycle. Lysis means to split open. So that's why we call it light, the lytic cycle. Let me just put a name here. So we call this the release stage, the release stage. So in the process, this living cell that infected died. That's why when you get infected by COVID, um, the same thing happens essentially. A virus will infect your lung cells, do this lytic cycle, and then those, your lung cells that were infected will die in the process. And therefore you get sick and you can't breathe well anymore. And eventually you die if you have a severe uh, consequence, right? So that's the lytic cycle. Very important. So to reiterate, virus infects living cell. First it attaches, then it penetrates, releasing the DNA or the, the, ge the genetic material. Then it, the living cell will use its own materials like ribosomes to read this instruction manual and biosynthesize it. Then it will mature, all the pieces will come together, and eventually there will be so many viruses inside this living cell, it will just explode, it will die and release all of them. Now they can go on and infect more cells, and you can see this is terrible, terrible, terrible. So this is the lytic cycle. This is an example of how viruses can replicate. So you can see how they need your cells. They cannot do it by themselves, they need you. So they are non-living, they need you to, re to replicate themselves. So it's very, very interesting and very terrible at the same time. So this is one example. Let's look at the next one, lysogenic. This one's um, kind of linked. It's, you'll see the lytic cycle is very important. Remember this one very well. The lysogenic cycle is slightly different, but it's linked to the lytic cycle. And you see what I mean. So we first start off, same thing, using the bacteriophage again as a virus, and then this uh, bacterial cell again. Even though, remember, we were talking about any living cell. It can be eukaryotic, it can be any other virus. We're just considering the process, okay? So don't... Um, be too fixed on the examples I'm using. Okay, so again, same thing. Um, we have this virus. It attaches, releases DNA. Um, and now what happens, something interesting. So it's released its DNA. So you can see here, this is DNA. And then, now what's happening, in some viruses, only some viruses can do this. So bear in mind, not all viruses can do this, only some. In some viruses, their DNA is able to get incorporated into the bacteria's DNA. So this is the bacteria's DNA, remember? Sometimes this, vi this virus DNA can get incorporated into it like this. And then, because it's now incorporated into ba to the bacteria's DNA, remember how I said living cells like eukaryotes or prokaryotes, they can do what? They can divide by mitosis, right? They'll, they can become many cells. So guess what? So it's tricky. This virus just is using this cells to its, to its advantage. It now injected its DNA and making it combine with the bacteria's DNA. So now then when the bacteria divides, guess what? The virus's DNA is also dividing. That's insane. So now if these cells divide and divide, you're making so many bacterial cells, but at the same time, oof, bad news, because this, this DNA right here can become a whole lot of virus, okay? So, um, so this process can keep happening and keep happening. This so right here, I have, a, I have a binary fission, right? It's how these bacteria cells divide. So you can see they're in the process of dividing, forming two separate cells. So this, this cell division process can happen over and over and over and over again until you have so many cells that have um, their own DNA plus this virus DNA. So I'm going to give you a key word here. We call this DNA, that is the bacteria's DNA and the viral DNA, the virus DNA, a prophage. And the reason why we call it a prophage 
is because pro means before and phage means this bacteriophage. So this is the, the, um, the thing before a, pro, um, a bacteriophage is formed. It's the DNA, right? It's the thing that leads to the formation of a bacteriophage. So we call it a prophase, phage, okay? This little thing. Then eventually, so it doesn't stop there. Eventually what can happen is this prophage can release the viral DNA back out again, like this, you can see. So it doesn't always stay in there. It can get released out again. And when this happens, that's the dangerous part. Now, this can undergo the lytic cycle, right? This can undergo the lytic cycle. What do I mean? These cells, we built up now thousands of these because of many divisions. And now, they, now the viral DNA is released like this in step five. And guess what? Now, they, this one can undergo the lytic cycle. Now we have this scenario here. We have the viral DNA and the, and the bacterial DNA. So it can now repeat this process. Now we formed so many of these cells and they can just go and do the lytic cycle and release many virions. So essentially, the lytic cycle is a cycle that shows how um, um, a virus can release its DNA and the cell can immediately use that DNA to make a lot of viruses. The lysogenic cycle is a cycle showing how um, a virus can inject its DNA into a, into a cell and that cell can incorporate that DNA into its own DNA and form many, many, many DNAs of viruses. That way, now we can form so many more viruses, right? So that's the important to understand the difference between these two cycles. The one, this one, isn't making any viruses directly, but it is making many potential viruses because it's making a lot of, it's replicating their DNA a lot so that, so that many viruses can now be made through the lytic cycle, not the lysogenic cycle. Key difference. Lytic cycle makes the, vir the virions. We call these virions, the little mini viruses released. Um, so the lytic cycle makes many virions directly, whereas the lysogenic cycle replicates the um, original virus's DNA many, many times. And then that's, those cells can now do the lytic cycle and go and divide and make um, more virions. So important. So these are two methods by which viruses use our cells, use living cells to replicate themselves. It's very interesting, but like I said, insane scary. Okay, so now that's, that's, a, that's the big bulk of it. So now we're going to go, there's three examples, according to the book, that you need to know about. Three um, examples of viruses. So all you, you need to know their names and you're going to need to know their structures vaguely. But you need to know them because they can be asked. So let's, we'll nail them down them one by one. There's not too much because they're kind of similar. But let's go through them. So the first one we're going to look at is bacteriophage lambda. That's kind of the one we just looked at, this one here. This is one kind of virus. And it's called bacteriophage lambda because it, it's viruses that infect bacteria, bacterial cells or prokaryotes. So let's look at the structure. Um, you can try and label these by yourselves. Try your best. Maybe you already know, so give it a go. Um, this right here is our capsid. Its job is to protect the DNA, right? That's one of its jobs. It can also do some attachment to cells and all that kind of thing. But in the for the bacteriophage lambda, its main job is to protect the DNA because these legs can atta do attachment. Okay, so back capsid, protection of the DNA, which is right inside here. Um, yeah, remember, I remember how I said viruses can have DNA or RNA. So the bacteriophage lambda has DNA, okay? And specifically double-stranded DNA. So that's just, that's just the normal DA, DNA we know, right? Our eukaryotic cells, like your, your body cells, have DNA double-stranded, right? Very important. Then we have this little neck piece here. Don't worry about that. That just attaches this headpiece to the rest of the rest of the um, virus. Then we have this piece right here called the tail sheath, and it's important. I'm going to explain it now. It's it's important because it can contract. You can imagine it to um, it can contract, become shorter and longer, and you'll see why this is very important. I'll explain it very shortly. Then we have these tail fibers, or they look like spider legs. They are used for attachment to the host cell, and that was obvious here. You can see they're attaching to the host cell. Um, then we have this little piece here, which we call the base plate. Don't worry about that one. That one pretty much just holds all these tail fibers together, all these legs together um, to the rest of the virus. And then lastly, we got this one, the pins. So the pins and the tail sheath work together. So I'm going to explain it now. The pin is pretty much just a sharp thing. It is going to be useful in penetrating the bacterial cell. Now, how does it penetrate it? Like this. If we look here, that this part here, remember? Um, it can contract, so it can come, become shorter and longer. So when this bacteriophage phage attaches to this bacterial cell, to in order to penetrate it, it has this sharp pin 
but the pin needs to be shoved into this into this bacteria. How does this pin get shoved into the bacteria? Because this little thing can become shorter and longer. It can contract. So when it contracts to become longer, it shoves the pin into the bacteria. So that's why, that's why the um, tail sheath is very important for contracting. So that's important. This is what you got to know for the bacteriophage lambda. That's it. That's it. Let's move on to the next one. Coronavirus. Why not? Because we're learning... Obviously, in the old syllabus, coronavirus does not even exist because the, the virus did not exist. So this is a new thing for you guys. Why called coronavirus? Corona is crown. It means crown, okay? So it's called coronavirus because it looks like a crown. If you look at the virus, it has these little things here popping out. So it looks a lot like a crown, okay? That's, that's why it's called coronavirus. Um, it is spherical in shape. So remember how I showed you there can be diff many different shapes. The bacteriophage is this complex shape. And in this one, the coronavirus is spherical in shape. <clears throat> let's label some things. So first, let's look at this one. These spikes. So they are embedded in this pink layer, which we call the envelope. So remember, I said some cells have an envelope, not all of them. And it is the layer that is right outside this layer. You see this layer? What's this layer? The capsid. So the capsid is good. It protects the DNA that's on the inside or the RNA or whatever nucleic acid it is. And then outside of the capsid, sometimes some viruses have an envelope. So here's the envelope. Um, um, and it is good for kind of recognition. Like I said before, it can recognize other cells and it can help attach them. Now these spikes, what is their role? So they're embedded in this envelope and they have important role. Their role is attachment. So they recognize certain cells in your body and they decide if they want to attach to it or not. So the coronavirus the spikes, they are made for attaching to your lungs, to your lung cells. So these spikes will bind to your lung cells. So that's their job. Other, other viruses, the spikes will do other jobs. But in coronavirus, it is going to bind to your um, um, lung cell receptors to destroy your lung cells, essentially. Um, now here, so remember in the bacteriophage, it was double-stranded DNA. Now in coronavirus, it is an RNA virus, right? Maybe you've heard that before. That's because it has RNA as its gen genetic material, single-stranded RNA, right? So that's good. That's it for coronavirus. And just remember, it basically damages the hell out of your lungs. Maybe you should probably know that by now. Because when you got sick from COVID, if you have gotten infected like most people, it wasn't nice. Okay, HIV. Human immunodeficiency virus. Interesting name because it infects the human. Um, immunodeficiency. So your this one, when it infects you, it doesn't um, infect your lungs like COVID does. It in fact infects your white blood cells. Remember, I talked here. It infects your white blood cells. Your white blood cells are very important in fighting. Uh, very important in your immune system. They're going to fight off those bacteria that infect you. Fight off those viruses that infect you. So. Ironically, this virus destroys your white blood cells, so it makes you immunodeficient. So it makes you immunodeficient, meaning you are, your immune system is compromised. You cannot, you're not very good at fighting off infections anymore. So because it destroys your white blood cells, so that's what this. That's why this one is definitely dangerous, and it's also spherical. So we've, we've talked now about two spherical ones: COVID, coronavirus, and we talked about one complex shape: bacteria, phage, lambda. Okay, see, this one also has spikes. But this one ain't going to attach to your lungs. Where do they attach to? Your white blood cells, right? And don't worry um, if you don't understand what white blood cells are and stuff. There's going to be a whole unit on the immune system at some point. So just know that white blood cells help you fight infection. And these viruses destroy your white blood cells. So by that logic, you become even worse at fighting infection. After this, you get infected by HIV. Okay, then we have, again, what's this layer here? This one here, the capsid protects your genetic material. In this case, the genetic material is what? RNA. And you can see there's two strands of RNA, one here, one here. They're not double-stranded, it's just two strands of single-stranded RNA. One strand of single RNA, another strand of single-stranded uh, RNA. Um, and then outside of the capsid, so HIV also has this other layer called the membrane, right? The viral envelope viral envelope. So both the HIV has a viral envelope and co coronavirus. And then what else we got? We got this little thing here, which we call reverse transcriptase. And I'll tell you what that is now. So 
when these cells infect your cells, right, they're going to release this DNA, like we saw before, into your cells, so your cells can read them. Now, these cells are special because they have these mo molecules called reverse transcriptase. This is an enzyme. An enzyme is a molecule that makes things happen. So the thing that this enzyme does is it, uh, it takes this virus's DNA and puts it into your DNA so that this virus DNA is forever in your DNA. Kind of like this idea. Um, kind of like this idea here. It takes the DNA and then, then this molecule called reverse, reverse transcriptase will take it and put it into your DNA. But the problem is it's forever. It's not like here where it can get released. It's forever. So that's very dangerous. So when you get infected with HIV, your body will always have this virus inside of you and it's super difficult to treat. That's why so many people die from it. So here I'll put it. We call the kind of virus that has this problem, this reverse transcriptase, um, we call it a retrovirus. And we call it a retrovirus because retro means reverse. So normally, um, DNA is turned into RNA for you to make proteins. But retrovirus is able to take its RNA and put it into your DNA. So it can do the opposite of what's normal, what's normally done. So it's a, you don't need to know more than that. So th that's just, there's a lot more complicated things going on. But you don't need, at, at, for IB, it's not something you need to know about. So know these three examples bacteriophage lambda know these structures no coronavirus and no hiv and know vaguely what they do okay not only their structures but also vaguely what they do okay so that's a lot we covered a lot now we covered a lot so we have one more thing we gotta cover and it's the origin of viruses it's fairly interesting and very straightforward so um i'll do that and then we're going to recap the video and that's all you need to know about viruses, okay? So I hope this really is, is, is helping you out. And it's hopefully the last video you need to watch on viruses, unless you want to do medicine or something one day. Okay, so origin of viruses. There's three theories. The first one is virus-first hypothesis. Because viruses are so, so, so simple, right? They have almost nothing except just DNA in a capsid, right? Um, because they're so simple, it is believed that viruses became viruses existed first and then cells existed. So one theory suggests that viruses existed first, and then later on, the viruses, some viruses developed into cells. So that's one theory. So the theory, I'll put the word here, is viruses originated before cell, because things generally go from simple to complex. So that's one theory. Uh, I, I'm not that big of a fan of this theory. Like It, it makes sense-ish, but I don't think this theory is going to be the right one. But it's, it's just called a theory, so it's not proven true yet or false yet. Um, so next one is regressive hypothesis or hypothesis. This is also known as the reduction or degeneracy hypothesis. So you need to know all these names in case they decide to be annoying and use one of those names. But this one's interesting. I like this one. The theory is, is that cells, there were cells. So viruses actually came after cells. And the theory was that there were big cells and small cells. And some, some small cells um, managed to invade. Um, normal cells, like it started benefiting from them, like um, by working together inside of them. And then because they got lazy, because they were working with these big cells, because they're team working, this one will get lazy because this one, this big one is going to do all of the work and the small one will just scavenge, scavenge and take the materials from it to survive. Because of that, this lazy small cell got lazy and do, lost a lot of its structures and became very, very simple. Its structure became very simple. And it's believed that, therefore, it eventually became a virus, essentially. Let me put it here. Like this small cell eventually became a virus over, over time of losing all of its complex structures. I like this one. It's kind of, that's kind of interesting. So here's the word form of what I just said. Viruses were once small cells that became parasites, right? Sucking out everything from this big cell. And eventually, it lost all its small structures, like the organelles and all that and lost um, a lot of its genetics because it became very simple and eventually started being a virus, non-living, because once it leaves, it's unable to survive. So that's another theory. So we got the virus-first hypothesis, we got the regressive hypothesis, or all these other crazy names. Now one more. You've done it, mate. You're at the last, last bit. Um, escape hypothesis. Okay, so this one's also super interesting. So it's believed that there was some bacteria or cell, and... Essentially, some of the DNA escaped, like when um, left the cell because some of some small break and it leaked out, and then these this um, this DNA or, or genetic material was just floating around in space and it got covered by a membrane. So a membrane started forming around it, and because that's essentially what a virus is, this is one theory of how viruses formed. 
because a virus is essentially a membrane surrounding some DNA or RNA, as you've been seeing throughout this video. Also, this escape hypothesis has another name, vagrancy hypothesis. So, you know, I don't like that they have so many names for it, but, you know, we can't change that. So here's the word form of that. DNA or RNA escapes larger cells and becomes surrounded by an outer membrane that forms a virus. Okay, I lied to you. I forgot. There's one small other bit. Wahaha. Evil me. Okay, so we got antigen, anti, two words we need to learn about. Um, antigenic shift and antigenic drift. Okay. First word you need to know is antigenic. So when you look at a cell, let me show you here. Um, when you look at a cell, like a prokaryote or a eukaryote or, or even a non-living thing like a virus, they have a lot of things on them, like little little structures and things that comprise them, right? Think about a human. You're a human. You have little hairs on you. You have ears. You have, sometimes you wear, sh like, you, you have clothing on you. You have things that represent you, right? So viruses and all these things also have these things that represent them, okay? And we call them antigens. So your own cells have their own antigens, and um, bacteria and viruses have their own antigens, okay? It's the things that represent them, what makes them them. That's an antigen. So here's the thing. We need to learn about this thing called ant antigenic shift. So normally you have a set amount of antigens. So a virus can have antigens. But over time, that those antigens can change. So for example, these things here, they're antigens. These things are antigens. All the things are antigens. But over time, they can change. They can either change fast or more slowly, drastic or more gradually. So if the change is very um, drastic, we call it antigenic shift. If the change is very slow, we call it antigenic drift. Okay, let me show you. So say we have a one virus here and another virus here, and they infect a cell at the same time. They will release their DNA into that cell at the same time. So say now that cell has two pieces of separate viruses DNA. So it's going to read both and make both. But by a mistake, it makes one virus out of both DNA. So now this baby virus is a mix of the original two viruses. So this is now a completely new virus because its antigens are a mix. It's different. It doesn't have the same antigens as before. It doesn't have these same markers that it had before. So this, this idea of antigenic shift is, is interesting because it means sometimes when you get infected, it can be by a completely new virus that never existed. And this makes it difficult for your body to cope with it and you get very sick. So here's some words that I want to put, you know, that I just explained. So we got these different viruses infect the same cell and recombine their genetic material. Um, then it leads to major changes in a very short time of these surface proteins or antigens of the virus. And so a totally new viral strain uh, is created and it's not recognized by your immune system because your immune system has never seen it before. It doesn't know how to kill it. It's very bad. Um, an example of this is influenza virus. The reason why you have to get a vaccine every year, for if you do, I don't, but a lot of people get influenza vaccines every year, is because they, this happens, this idea of antigenic shift. Sometimes you get infected by one, so one influenza virus and then a completely another one, and you get this new strand, and now, now the vaccines from last year doesn't work anymore, so you need to get a new one. So this influenza, so this, an example of this antigenic shift is um, influenza virus. So therefore, they have to make new vaccines every year because this crap keeps happening. Um, because, for example, last year, the vaccine targeted this part. If, it, if, it, if, it, if the vaccine targeted this part, then the virus would die. Um, but now, this, this virus has both this part and that part. So now that it attacks this part, uh, it's not good enough because this other part means it can still survive. Because now only half the things are killed. You see what I mean? So that's why. Now, antigenic drift is different. It is more gradual. So, the changes that happen are very incremental. They're very slow, very slow over time, not drastic like this one, okay? So, the DNA has very small changes over time. Naturally, when, when, um, when, um, when viruses get created, their DNA gradually gets changed. The code, you know how it's a code, isn't always copied exactly. So, when, it, when a virus infects a cell and gets remade, it's not always remade exactly identical. Sometimes small mistakes happen in the DNA. So over time, over a long period of time, the virus gradually starts getting, actually start changing because the DNA is gradually changing. So the DNA is responsible 
for coding all these things. And if the DNA is slightly altered over a long period of time, over a lot of small mistakes, then the virus will ultimately change because the code changed. So that's, but you can see this one is far more gradual than antigenic shift, okay? Because you can think, I like to think of the words, drift sounds slow, you're drifting. Where shifting is like, you're quickly changing, changing something. Okay, so small incremental changes, which leads to slowly producing variation in the surface proteins of the virus. And these accumulated changes eventually prevents the immune system from recognizing the virus. So this one was drastic. The immune system can't recognize it. This one is more slowly over time. And an example of this one, this antigenic drift, is HIV. And, and again, this is the reason why it's so difficult for doctors to treat HIV, because it's always changing. It's never the same virus. It's always changing, becoming different, and the medications don't work anymore. So thanks to these two things, doctors have a hard time helping these kind of problems. So that's it for this video. I, there's a lot to it, I know, but I hope uh, these things helped, and I know this can help you out your test and whatever. If you have any questions, feel free to ask it. Um, I hope this is useful. I don't want to take more time from you to make a summary, but I think you get it. I hope this is useful, and see you in the next one.